So the church teaches us that the greatest sin of humanity is what? It's pride. Pride's the greatest sin of humanity. That can be a little hard for us to understand sometimes. We're going to get into that just a little bit. So pride is a, is a sin that affects all of us. And what pride's about, pride is that I don't want to let God be God. I want to be God. It's that I'm not going to let God tell me how I should live my life, and I'm not going to be dependent on Him. I'm not going to look to God as the one who directs my life, who guides me into what it means to find joy and life and happiness. But really, it's about me. And what happens when we do that is we start to make life about us. Right? We make ourselves the center of the universe, the center of the story. So I, I don't know if you know this, I know you've never thought this about me, but I'm a prideful man. Yes. <laughs> but I am, I, pride is deeply rooted in me. Uh, there's just a piece of me, I can kind of give the facade, and I know you can too, like someone who can be talking and you disagree with them, and you're like, yeah. And underneath the surface, you're like, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> we just tend to think that. I tend to think that I know more than other people. right? I tend to think that I'm always right. And I tend to make things about me. And one of the ways that God heals us of this, uh, I think it's um, uh, Liguori who says, there is no humility without humiliations. Right, the way you kind of get over yourself is when you're humiliated and you realize, okay, maybe I'm not that big of a deal. So one of the ways that God has been so good to me is he humbles me. And in recent years of Lord's, things have gone so well here. God has been so awesome. And one of the things that he keeps doing to bless me is that every time a story runs about Lord's, they'll quote me and they'll put a picture of my friend Father John Nepple. <laughs> Every single time, without fail. And it's actually become a joke in, my, in our offices. If you come to our offices, you come and meet with me on my door to my office. The, one, of, one media outlet, which shall remain nameless, they tweeted something that I said, and they quoted it, Father Barry Larkin. <laughs> Picture, Father John Nepple. <laughs> And I was like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I was like, this is my life. Like, I was too prideful. You need to knock me down. We do that. And it's so funny because as a priest, that just stings my pride. I'm like, got to be humble. Got to be humble. Lord, don't let me get too inflated. Keep me humble. And then something like that happens. And I'm like, I hate everyone. <laughs> Tonight, what I want to share with you is a story of tremendous obedience and humility. And it's something that inspires me deeply. I, the way this talk came about was our staff, it's, it's so wonderful to work at a parish because we talk about God every day. And one day I was just sharing the story I'm going to share with you tonight, and our staff looked at me and they said, you have to talk about that story. You have to tell the parish that story. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. But tonight's story is not just about someone else. Tonight, our talk is about you. It's about the great drama of human life. It's the, the battle that's inside every one of our hearts. It's about the story of your life and the choices you're going to make tonight and tomorrow and in 10 years until the day you die. And our subject tonight is Father Henry de Lubach. And we'll get to this. By the end of his life, he was named a cardinal by St. John Paul II. Most of us probably don't know who he is. But I hope by the end of the night, you're not going to know everything about him. You're not going to know all this theology. But my hope is tonight that I can introduce you to a friend. So St. Jose Maria Scriva says that we as Catholics, that every day we should tell someone about a saint. Every day we should tell someone about a saint. And the world 
for people of faith, the world so easily turns into a dark place. And, and a story we all hear and we all tell ourselves is that there are no saints left. The world's become anti-Christian, which I, I really think it's going that way, at least in our part of the world. And we need those little moments of hope. We need those little stories that lift us up and inspire us. And so Henry de Lubach is someone who, he's not a canonized saint. I hope he will be someday. But he's someone who I consider like a saint with a small s. He's one of the people I look up to in my life who inspires me and invites me to become more the man that God created me to be. Okay, so we have to talk about scripture. Because if we don't, it'd be totally lame. So, John Neiman tonight, he was in RCA, and he said, he's like, what Greek are you going to throw out tonight? I was like, I don't have any Greek. He said, you have to throw out one Greek, Greek word. So we'll give you two. So tonight's topic is Henry de Lubach and the Hupakoe Pistu. Hupakoe, Hupakoe in Greek means obedience, and pistis in Greek means faith. And so tonight's topic, the, the title for our talk is Henry de Lubach and the obedience of faith. So in Romans chapter 1, you're going to learn something about Scripture tonight, I hope. When the, the Bible, sometimes what it does is if, if it wants to tell us what a topic is, if it wants to make a section of a, a letter or one of the, the books of the prophets, they didn't have chapter divisions in the ancient world. And so oftentimes the way that they broke off chapters, or if they wanted to say, here's a theme of an entire book or an entire letter, is they would bracket it. They'd put one story at the beginning or a line at the beginning and one at the end. So for instance, in Mark's Gospel, there's a section where Jesus is walking to Jerusalem and at the beginning of that walk, he heals a blind man. And in, on the way to Jerusalem, the main theme of that section in Mark's Gospel is that the apostles are blind. Because they don't see who Jesus is. And so Jesus heals a blind man, and then the whole theme is about how the apostles are blind. And then, at the end of the section, Jesus heals another blind man. And Mark's showing us that this is what this section's all about. So in Paul's letter to the Romans, most people think that Romans is about how do I go to heaven? And Romans has advice for that. It, it's not unrelated to that, but that's not the main subject. Paul, so in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, St. Paul is talking about why he's an apostle. Why did God make me an apostle? And that's his whole life. And he says, God, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, well, why did God make Paul an apostle? And he says, in order to bring about the obedience of faith. The hupokoe pistu. And actually, I think it's plural, so it's actually, some, you didn't correct my conjugation. Hupokoe pisteos. Hupokoe pisteos. Father Brady, that's your fault. So Paul says that, he says, the whole reason God made me an apostle is for one reason. It was to bring about the obedience of faith. And the end of Romans, in chapter 16, Paul says the same thing. He, he finishes the whole letter, and he says, the whole reason that I'm writing you, and the whole reason that I'm living the way I do, is so that you might have the obedience of faith. Side note. Catholics and Protestants debate about is it faith or is it works? Do you notice how that phrase dissolves that? The obedience of faith is both. You can't have one without the other. All right? Faith and obedience are almost the same thing. And we'll get to that. So that's Romans 1. And then in Romans 5 we hear this. And St. Paul is going to talk about Jesus and Adam. In chapter 5 he says this. He talks about how all of us are basically Adam. And what that means is that it's pride. It means you and I want to be God. It's like, Lord, yes, I love you, but don't tell me what to do. 
I mean, I want to go to heaven. Like, sure, it's pretty wicked cool up there. I'm worried it might get a little boring because eternity sounds really long. You know, but so are Father Brian's homilies, and so I'd rather just kind of live life, and can't you just bring me to heaven at the end? All of us, we just want to live life, and we want to be in control. I want to run the show. I want to do things the way I want to do them. And so chapter 5 of Romans, Paul talks about how the main difference between what it means to be a normal human, which is like being Adam, and being a Christian is about obedience. So he says this, he says, By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Who is the one man who is disobedient? Who is he talking about? Adam, right? The one man was Adam. And when, when St. Paul talks about Adam, he doesn't just mean Adam, he means humanity. Because Adam sinned against God and was disobedient. That's just in all of us. I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen to God. I want to do things my way. And, then, and so if you're disobedient to the church or to Christ or to your mother, it's not that you're a bad person. It's that you're normal. That's part of original sin. That's all of us. As one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience... Now, who's the one man who is obedient? It says, by the one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Who's the one man who is obedient? Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And not just there, but that's, that's kind of the high point. Jesus prays to the Father and he says, Father, if it's possible, let this chalice pass. Right? I don't want to go to the cross. But not my will, but yours be done. So St. Paul tells us, and this is not just Romans, but you know me, we'd be here all night. The, the main distinction in humanity, brothers and sisters, is that all of us are like Adam. So am I. The, the worst thing, if you want to get a rise out of me, just tell me what to do without asking. And it could be something I want to do. be like, all right, FB, go get gelato. I'd be like, who the heck do you think you are? Because <laughs> right. Adam's inside of me. I'm like, you're not going to tell me. I am a priest of the one true God of the Most High Church. How dare you tell me what to do? Right? But if Jesus is in us, we learn to become like him. We learn to lay our lives down. So in Romans, later on, in, Paul's going to talk about how this plays out in each of our lives. And we're going to wrestle with this, brothers and sisters, the rest of our lives. But in chapter 7, St. Paul talks about, he says, there's a good thing that I want to do, but I don't do it. And the good that I do want to do, I never do, but the, do, the bad that I do want to avoid is what I do. And you're like, I have no idea what just happened. But Paul's still talking about the same thing. What he's talking about is that Adam is inside of me, and so is Jesus. That I found Christ and I want to love God and I want to, I want to obey him, not because I have to, but because I love him. Because I know he loves me, but I struggle to do that. And there's this battle inside of me. And we're going to jump to Henry Lubach. But tonight, brothers and sisters, this is what I want to share with you. The Christian life, make no mistake, if it lacks obedience, is not a Christian life. If the Christian life lacks obedience, it is not a Christian life. Because in the end, what we do is we do what we want to do. But Christ teaches us, right, that the, the salvation of the world... One more story. I always love it. Lord, we have so many very devout Catholics, and I love that. And I do a lot of weddings. And a lot of our couples, they're so strong in their faith that they get that passage in Ephesians 5 that says, wives be submissive to your husbands. And so I go to these weddings, and you know there's like half of the crowd is secular and hasn't gone to church in 20 years. And so I kind of have to explain, I'm like, I know you all, when you heard wives be submissive, you were like, oh, 
Like seriously? And we imagine like the worst possible husband who's just a total jerk and abusive and all of that. But what I always tell people is that Ephesians 5, what it's about is that that husband we're supposed to imagine is Christ. It's a husband who lays his life down for his bride in complete love and total submission to his bride. And so the bride and the groom are mutually submissive. So Romans 5, what St. Paul is telling us, right, is that the obedience you and I are called to have is not an obedience to someone who's just going to be like, yep, Father Brian, you're prideful. And God never calls me Father. But (laughs) Brian, you're prideful. I therefore command you to have pictures of Father John Nepple referencing you for the rest of your life. That's not it. God is, he wants us to obey him not because, even because it's true, it's tied to that, but it's because he loves us so much and the truth is good for us. Okay, so Henry de Lubach. So de Lubach is one of the most important Catholic thinkers of the last century. He was born... Uh, in 1896. He died in 1991. He was a Frenchman. Uh, he was drafted into World War I in 1914. And if you think about that, that's what a dramatic thing that is. You know, as a, a Frenchman, and you see the Nazi, or they're not the Nazis yet, but the Germans marching in and fighting against your country. Dilubach drafted in 1914. He was injured in the head in 1917, and he had major problems with his health because of that until the 1950s. In 1927, he was ordained a priest. In 1931, he took his vows as a Jesuit. If you're in the Jesuit order of priests, it takes a long time until they let you take your final vows. So he did that in 1931. He's one of the greatest intellectuals of the last century. Uh, We could list his books, but I mean, I don't know, he probably published about 50 books, something like that. He founded a new kind of series in, in academia called Christian Sources, where it helped people to go back and understand the very beginnings of Christianity. Not just recent things, but the, the men and women who first encountered the gospel. Those writings have actually helped me and my my brother priest and the companions. They formed us as the kind of men we are. So here's where it gets dramatic. And we won't get to the details of this, but in 1946, there's this raging debate. Raging debate in theology, and it's all about grace and nature. And it's about if you and I, if God wasn't going to bring us to heaven, could it ever have been possible that God created us so we could just be happy in an earthly way. And there's this huge debate about that. I know you've stayed up on that. Uh, no, we haven't. You should if you were a good Catholic. I'm just kidding. So the Lubach debates that. He's a part of that debate. And in 1946, he publishes an essay called Surnatural, which means the supernatural. And it's just, it's hugely controversial. It's in the heat of the debate. And it's attacked. And he's a very prestigious theologian, priest, teacher. And here's what happens. Is pressure rises, the debate rises. And in 1950, in August of 1950, Pope Pius XII wrote an encyclical called Humani Generis. And there were rumors floating around that in that encyclical... He was going to condemn certain ideas as not fitting with the Catholic faith. And the Jesuits who were above the Lubach read into that and they said, the Pope's going to condemn Henry de Lubach. And so in June of 1950, one of the greatest minds in Catholicism of the modern era was silenced. He was forbidden to teach. He was forbidden to publish any books. He was exiled from the university that he taught at. And he was basically given no opportunity to defend himself. That 
period of time where he was kind of in that state, that lasted for eight years until 1958. And we'll get to this, but have you ever been misunderstood? Has anyone ever called you Father Barry Larkin? <laughs> When I study Henry de Lubac, I'm so humbled. Because when someone, when I've done something well, what I want more than anything is I want people to see it. And when I've done something that's not good, I want to hide it. And if I'm misunderstood, if I'm actually, if someone thinks something bad about me that actually isn't true, that's a tremendous suffering for me. Because I'm prideful. So de Lubac, Right, think about that. If you were him, what would you do? Yeah, I, I don't know what I would do, but I, I think I'd probably throw a temper tantrum and be like, I never liked Catholicism anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Take your stupid TJ position. <laughs> of course he didn't. To the Lubach, and this is always, brothers and sisters, the obedience of faith. Right? Obedience is not obedience until you're challenged. If someone gives you a command that's easier for you, that's, that's not real obedience. We want to be like Jesus. When Jesus, when the Father says to him, I want you to go to the cross to save humanity. And Jesus knows the suffering that will be his and the darkness that will be his. And he says, not my will, but yours be done. That's who you and I are called to be. We're called to share in that. And De Lubach did that. He didn't complain. He was obedient to the church. If you know anything about saints, a lot of saints have done this. Padre Pio, who's one of the greatest saints of the modern world, weird stuff was happening with him, right? If you came to Mass of Lords and my hand started bleeding and I levitated, you'd be like, we are out of here. <laughs> All Souls is three miles away. <laughs> and you know it's true. <laughs> Padre Pio, right, he started levitating, he had the stigmata, he bled with the, the wounds of Christ. And the church for a period of time said, we don't know what's happening here, we need to investigate. And they forbid him from saying mass publicly. And again, if I was Padre Pio, I'd be like, seriously? <laughs> Which is why God hasn't given me the stigmata, thank you. <laughs> but he was obedient, right? He listened to the church. He was wholly obedient. He didn't complain. He loved God. He saw it as a way to imitate Christ. And so De Lubach was obedient all throughout this time. And my favorite part of this story is that during that time, he put together one of my favorite books. When I am injured, when people don't understand me, when I'm falsely accused, in my life, I act out of that wound. I was praying about this talk today, and I was so convicted because I'm like, I've done this recently. Right, where I've just acted so in such a petty manner. So Lubach wrote a book in that period of time, which is considered the greatest book on the church in the last century. It's called The Splendor of the Church. If the Catholic Church had silenced me, taken away the one thing that was my greatest gift, I don't know that I would write a book called The Splendor of the Church. But he did. So I just want to read you a couple lines. It's so powerful. So to Lubach, he, in the middle of that book, he describes what particularly a priest should be, but really any Catholic. And he uses the Latin phrase vir ecclesiasticus, which means a man of the church. And he says this, he says, Such a man will have fallen in love with the beauty of the house of God. The church will have stolen his heart. Right, being a Catholic, right? You know, if you don't fall in love with the church, if you don't see the wisdom, the beauty, the power of the sacraments, the saints, if you never fall in love with that, you'll never be a real Catholic. Even with all the problems we have, with all the, the scandals and the different sins that have happened in history, if you can't see the beauty of the church, if you can't fall in love with it, 
You'll have missed something. The church will have stolen his heart. She is his spiritual native country. The church is his mother and his brethren. And nothing that concerns her will leave him indifferent or detached, right? If the church is off to war on some issue, all of us should be in, right? It's not just, you know, God, I've been pretty good, so could you, like, pay off my mortgage and make sure that I go to heaven? A person whose heart is truly a Catholic heart, when the church is upset about something, they're upset about something. When the church is okay with something, they're okay with it. Because the church has the mind of Christ. He will root himself in the church's soil. He will form himself in her likeness and make himself one with her experience. It will be from her that he learns how to live and how to die. And this is my favorite line. Think of that context. Falsely kind of confused or um, condemned, stripped of his teaching position, the Lubach says this. Far from passing judgment on her, the church, he will allow her to judge him. And he will agree gladly to all the sacrifices demanded by her unity. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? <laughs> right? The, the modern world, and it's, it's funny, people will say to me, I don't know what your experience is like as a Catholic, but as a priest, my life is so weird. Um, but people will talk to me in public and they'll just start going after the church. And they'll think that we're going to be friends at the end of the conversation. <laughs> right? And they're like, they're, they're kind of like, well, you seem like a reasonable guy. You're really good looking. Like, you must get this. You know? <laughs> they don't say that, but you know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I know. Pride. Um, but they're like, people will talk to me and they're like, I just don't get Catholicism. This is horrible. This is horrible. This is horrible. I hate this and that and that. And I'm like, the church is not an institution I belong to. The church is my bride in Christ. She is my mother. She is the thing I have given my heart and soul and my life for. And imagine if someone said that to your spouse. Imagine that. Imagine someone came to you, hey, hey, you seem like a cool guy. I just want to go after your wife for a while and tell you how horrible she is. So I just slap him in the face and move on. <laughs> but that's the attitude, right? Not one of vengeance. But you and I, right? We're not called to just obey the church. We're called to obey the church because we love her. Because she is the place that God has placed all truth. She's not just someone who teaches us. The church is someone who gives us life. Who loves us from the time we're baptized until the moment we die. Who protects us with her prayers. Who helps us to grow in holiness. Who reads God's words to us. That's the attitude to Lubach has. The man of the church does not stop short at mere obedience. He loves obedience in itself and will never be satisfied with obeying of necessity and without love. If you really want to be a Christian, you have to be obedient, but not just from a spirit of, I don't want to go to H-E double hockey sticks. You want to be a real Christian is because you want to be like Christ. Love will make you obedient. Right? If you really love someone, you become obedient. When people get married, you know, one of the things I try to do in marriage prep is I try to show men and women that marriage, the true beauty of marriage, and there's nothing more beautiful except for divine things. In marriage, we actually let go of it we want for ourselves because we love someone so much we say, I will lay down my life for you. Love makes you obedient. Right? Your children, you're never so obedient as when you have children. Right? When, when people have children, they're up at three in the morning getting glasses of milk and comforting kids over nightmares. and you know, <clears throat> They come to church at Lourdes and they're in and out of the gym, which is 110 degrees at like 20 times. It's amazing. It makes them more like Jesus Christ. The obedience of faith. 
Jesus Lubach wrote that, the splendor of the church. In 1958, his censure was lifted. And after that time, Pius XII himself, who wrote that encyclical, Humani Generis, he actually met with Father Dubach and he said, oh, I never intended anything negative about you. And he was completely vindicated in his theological positions. In 1960, 60, I'm sorry, 1962 to 1965, Vatican Council II happened in Rome. And de Lubach was named as one of the, what's called a, a periti, a peritus, an expert. And the things that you and I take for granted, so many of the things we take for granted about the church's teaching in our lives, in the modern world, were brought to light by de Lubach. He's quoted in Vatican II. He was one of the main architects of some of its documents. In 1983, St. John Paul II named him a cardinal of the church. And what that means, by the way, like there, there's kind of two types of cardinals in the church. One is the, the bishops of large dioceses, and they help vote for the next pope. They're in a kind of bigger position. But then sometimes popes will name people in the church who have given an incredible gift to our church. They'll give them the, the title of cardinal as a way to honor them. And so St. John Paul II named Henry de Lubac a cardinal in 1983. There's so much more, but what I want to leave you with tonight, before we go to Q&A, to be a Catholic, and, what, and this is what de Lubac understood, to be a Catholic is not to think correctly. That's actually really important, right? The truth matters. Jesus tells us that the truth will set us free. So the truth absolutely matters, and we need to care about that. But the truth is meant to make us into a certain kind of person. It's meant to lead us to be men and women who surrender our lives in love. And when tough things come our way, that you and I are different from the rest of the world. We don't think the way that your next door neighbor thinks. We have the mind of Jesus Christ. So lastly tonight, the, uh, I want to leave you with this. The... Obedience is one of what's called the three evangelical councils. I haven't even looked at the time. Oh, we've got like 20 more minutes. <laughs> so there's these, these three councils. Priests are called to live this out. I will tell you, I don't live any of them well. I'm trying. I fail every day. But we're called to live three of them. We're called to live poverty chastity, and obedience. And what I want to tell you to leave you tonight is your call to all three of those things. Not in the same way I am. Right? If you're called to marriage, you're going to live that differently than I am. And that's how it should be. But we're all called to those three things. And here's why. St. Thomas Aquinas says that we have three good things in our lives. We have things that are outside of us. Right? The things you own are good things. Right? My... Subaru is amazing. It has heated seats. My last car did not have power windows. This one does. Amazing. <laughs> Those are good things, right? The things you want are good things. But St. Thomas Aquinas says if you love someone, you want to give your life away to them. Right? When you fell in love with your spouse, those of you who are married, when you fell in love, you said, I just want to give you everything. I want to give you my heart. I want to give you my life. And so Aquinas says the first thing we can give away when we fall in love with God, which is what it means to be a Christian, is we can say everything I have is yours. Right? Maybe I'm supposed to, to, to live a comfortable life for the sake of the church and for the sake of my family. But you're going to be different from someone next to you because your things that you own are really God's. The second thing that you have, the, be the next best thing that you have, St. Thomas Aquinas says, which is better than external goods, is your body. He says your body is a greater good than external things. And Aquinas says that if you want to love God, the second thing that someone can give away and renounce is their body. And that's why the New Testament teaches us that the second evangelical counsel is chastity. And, right, you're all called to chastity, every one of you. 
different maybe from a priest or religious, if you're called to marriage. But if you're in marriage, right, you're called to a chaste, loving relationship in the context of marriage. Right? Your body is not your own. It belongs to your spouse and to God. And you don't just do whatever you want to do. But because you love, you lay your body down. And then thirdly, the last one is the hardest. Right? The last one is always the hardest. Well, the hardest one is obedience. And I never thought it was when I was in seminary. I was like, obedience, it can't be that hard. Right? Then you like get in a car with your friend and they put on a song you don't like and you're like, give me the phone. Right? <laughs> and they're not listening to that song. The greatest gift we have as human beings is our free will. I, I love being able to do what I want to do, go where I want to go. I love the freedom to choose. But if you love someone, and when you love someone, you surrender your will to them. When you love your spouse, you say, you know what, honey, I really want to do X, Y, or Z, but I love you so much, I don't even care. As long as I'm with you, as long as I have you, everything I have is yours. Jesus, in St. John Paul II, says this. He says, On the cross, the greatest moment of the Christian life, on the cross where Jesus died, Jesus was poor. Everything he had was stripped from him. Right? The last thing he owned was his cloak, and the soldiers stripped that from him, so he's naked. So Jesus is completely poor on the cross. He's chased. He's crucified naked. And the fathers of the church tell us that that goes back to Adam and Eve when they're naked without shame. And Jesus dies for his bride on the cross. And so Jesus is chased. And remember, he's poor and he's chased because he loves. Because he doesn't want to just give part of his life. He wants to say, here's everything. God, here's everything. Church, my bride, here's everything. So Jesus is poor. He's chased. And of course, the greatest, right? The greatest of the three, Jesus is obedient. Right? On the cross, he lays down everything he has, everything he is. Everything is given over to the Father. So beautiful. Now, I do not live up to any of that, but isn't that inspiring? The church, right, you and I, every one of us, we're called to be more like Jesus. We're called to give everything we have. The day I die and I go before God, I want to be able to say, Lord, I gave as much as I could. I loved you, not in a, in a half-hearted way, not with some of what I had. I want to go before the throne of God and I say, Lord, you're my everything. Everything I had in life was yours. <laughs> The Lubach shows us that. And so, as we, we wrap up tonight, I just hope that inspires you. Obedience is real. You can do it. When someone offends you, when you're not recognized for the gifts that you have, right, you can choose to not just get all puffed up and say, do you realize what a big deal I am? Right? <laughs> you can choose not to do that. Right? You can choose... To be like Jesus, you can choose to be humble and to say, I want to give my life away. I want to swallow my pride. I want to live for the glory of God. So I hope you're inspired tonight. Uh, as we leave, we'll, we'll do a few Q&A, not too many tonight. Uh, but uh, I hope that inspires you. And as Jose Maria Escriva says, every day, every day, you should tell someone about a saint. You should tell someone, this world's hard. We all have difficulties. You should tell someone about an inspiring man or woman who leads them to closer to God, leads them to a greater holiness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, everybody. We'll have time for maybe one or two questions. <laughs>